Our scripture reading this morning is 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, and we'll hear about Eli and Samuel. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare, and visions were quite uncommon. One night, Eli, who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. Suddenly the Lord called out, Samuel! Yes, Samuel replied, what is it? He got up and ran to Eli. Here I am, did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. So he did. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel! Again Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am, did you call me? I didn't call you, my son, Eli said. Go back to bed. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he never had a message from the Lord before. So the Lord called a third time, and once more Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am, did you call me? Then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to Samuel, go and lie down again, and if someone calls again, say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed, and the Lord came and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, Speak, your servant is listening. Did you realize I had it backwards? Yes. <laughs> I cannot believe no one helped me out there. I had the thing completely upside down. <laughs> but, yeah. But I did give my disclaimer before, right? I said I was not good at names. <laughs> Let us hear the reading of the gospel. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Come. Follow me. Philip was from Beth Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, We have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth? exclaimed Nathanael. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. As they approached, Jesus said, Now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. How do you know about me? Nathanael asked. Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Then Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Jesus asked him, Do you believe this just because I told you I had seen you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, I tell you the truth. You will all see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man. The one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Today I want to interest us in contemplating, if you will, what it is like when God calls out to us. Now I have many stories many experiences of hearing the voice of God speaking to me, directing me. And I think for many of us, perhaps the most common or something that we all can relate to, maybe you're driving down the road and the Lord says to you, do not go the way you used to go, turn here and go around the road and you just said to yourself, perhaps, well, 
nah, I like this way. I don't know that way that well. And you go down and there is an accident and it's all blocked up and instead of taking you five minutes, it takes you 55 minutes. And then you probably ponder to yourself and say, oh, maybe that was the Lord speaking to me. And in simple ways like that, God speaks to us every single day. And I know that many a times I don't follow and that's how I know that God was speaking to me. Because when I hear what I shouldn't do or what I should do and I do the opposite, then I get the kind of results that I do not enjoy. Like the, like the example I, I mentioned just now, you know, driving on the road and God said, turn this way and go the other way. And instead I go the way that I feel like I want to go because that's what I'm familiar with. And many a times we miss out on hearing God speaking to us because sometimes the things that God has to say to us do not really fit into what we are comfortable with or what we are familiar with or what is our preference or what it is that we like. And then when we have a negative outcome, we might reflect and say to ourselves, but maybe that was God speaking to me. Maybe that was God directing me. Now, though Samuel was chosen and was special, he is not or was not so special that he was like one of the only persons that heard, heard the voice of God. Because God speaks to all of us. There is not one of us that God creates that God does not speak to us. It's a question of whether or not we are able to hear the voice of God when God speaks to us. And that comes with practice and it comes with relationship. Or if I say, Jane, if you hear a voice around the back there but you can't see it, but it sounds like one of your kids, you will know. Because that voice you have become familiar with over time. You have had a relationship with that person. And that voice speaks not just to your, to your ears and to your auditory senses, but it speaks to your soul because you have that kind of connection. And it's the same thing for all of us. And we have a relationship. We've had a relationship. And maybe if I was speaking from the back of the, 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 the building, speaking over the public address system, but you didn't see me, you're most likely able to say that that is Nicholas speaking. Because over time, you have become familiar with my voice. We have developed some kind of connection together. We have shared space in fellowship together. Our hearts have somehow crossed. Our souls have somehow had interaction. And therefore, you're able to identify, not just with your auditory senses, but with your soul and your spirit, you're able to tell. I tell you this story then. The, the Great Wall of China was built to protect that country against enemy attacks. And perhaps you, you, you have heard about the Great Wall of China. And it took about 20 years to build. Very long wall. It, it is wide enough for soldiers and horsemen to use as a roadway. It is over two stories high and about 4,000 miles long. It is only man-made structure that is visible from outer space. Yet, for all its strength, it was penetrated by the enemy at least three times. How? By breaking down the wall? No, absolutely not. By climbing over it? No, absolutely not. But simple, on each of the three occasions, the guards who were watching and protecting failed 
in their duty to do so. This was the sin of Eli. God charged him for failing to be a parent when he neglected even to attempt to restrain his two sons from exploiting their positions as servants in the temple, thus dishonoring and grieving God. Now from the accounts of the breach of the Great Wall of China and the failure of Eli to restrain his sons, we see where one person's omission or dereliction of duty can be calamitous to many others who depend on his or her role. Omissions permit the play of forces which are destructive to human life. Because of what Eli did, and for that matter, did not do, we read that the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions, according to verse 1. And we know that where there is no vision, the scripture says that the people perish. God therefore began the institution of a new order, a new dispensation, that his word might once again find its place with his people. God's word must go forth and also must be proven to be true. And to accomplish this, according to Timothy Simpson, God raised up the boy Samuel. Samuel's purpose was to repair the breach created by Eli, the priest at Shiloh, and his sons, to whom the word of the Lord, by the time of the story, hardly ever came anymore. Now, according to this story, Samuel has no pedigree that would give him clout or make him worthy of any special notice by those in authority, not even being from the right tribe for priestly activity. He was from the tribe of Ephraim, and those who had priestly activities in the temple were from the tribe of Levi. Now here we find Samuel still a child under the tutelage of the silvery old priest Eli whose senses are as dense and as ineffectual as his spirituality. Yet even here Samuel's character's threshold surfaces in relation to two primary figures in his life thus far. For his mother Hannah I'm not sure, but the story concerning how Samuel came to be, Hannah was barren and could not have child. And he was, she was married to a, an influential person by the name of Elkanah. And Elkanah had another wife by the name of Penina. And Penina would cause all kinds of trouble. For Hannah. She would mock her, she would bully her, she would use the fact that she couldn't have children every day as a battering ramp over her head. And Hannah was mostly unhappy, living a very sad life. And she prayed and she cried to the Lord and she was in such a state that one day she went into the temple and she was praying. Eli saw her and thought that she was drunk because of how she was praying to the Lord. She prayed, if you give me a child, I will give him back to you. And so the Lord heard her prayer and removed her barrenness. And she was able to conceive and gave birth to Samuel. And as soon as the boy was ready, she gave him to the Lord through his servant, the priest Eli, for work in the temple. 
And for those of us who are even more familiar with the story of Samuel, you know that Samuel was one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. So for his mother, Hannah, the appearance of Samuel marks the end of her suffering, her torment at the hands of those like Penina who mocked her barrenness, as I mentioned before. For Eli, however, the coming of Samuel is experienced quite differently. The coming of the child marks the beginning of his suffering, even as God uses the child as the channel through whom to deliver Eli and his sons their retirement benefits. Eli, to his credit, finally gets it. Managing like Samson to summon up a last bit of his vitality near the end to do what he was supposed to have been doing all along. Now God's word will come true and Samuel's destiny was decided before he was born when Hannah first made her promise to give him to the Lord. However, Samuel had never had an experience of God's presence and this made it difficult for him to discern what was happening but he was not alone it took a while for Eli to realize as well God speaks into a time when the Israelites were threatened by the superior power of the Philistines and although Eli was innocent somewhat his sons were corrupt this call of Samuel is often romanticized but we know from later in the story that Samuel was the spokesperson for God this obligation to speak God's word caused him great anguish a call by God is not simply a spectacular experience God God's call is a commission to serve him in a world that despises him and rejects him. So though it is hard to discern who are the heralds of God and God's word in this day and age, for we hear all kinds of preachers everywhere saying all kinds of things. The latest scandal, I cannot believe it. Well, I have not even delved into it greatly. As one of those great preachers, I will not mention the name at this point in time, who was caught up in some kind of activity that brought his name into serious question and his character into serious disrepute. A mega church of over 40,000 members. But we hear all of these things and we hear people preaching all kinds of things everywhere. It is not easy for one to step into that place of answering God's call and following God's way. I remember when I just got the call for ministry, it was exciting. It was really exciting. I, I, I think I almost felt like Samuel, right? When I realized that God was actually speaking to me and God was calling my name, it was exciting. But then the reality struck and I tried to run away from that call. And though initially I said yes, I started to reject the call. I started to say, God, but I'm too young. Only 18, no, sorry, younger than that. 17 at the time when I heard the call. I said, but God, I haven't even gone to university as yet. I want to have a career. I want to start a family. I want to establish myself and then I can come and serve you. That was how I was trying to rationalize not responding to the call of God at the time. And I wrestled with God for a complete year. I wrestled, I wrestled, I resisted, I resisted. I said, no, no, I'm not doing it. No, no, I'm not doing it. 
And I started to do all kinds of things to run away from the call. And every Sunday I went to church and I sat there, my heart would burn inside of me. Every time I heard the word of God spoke, it was as though there was fire causing me to become uncomfortable where I was sitting. And after about a full year, I couldn't take it anymore. I said, okay, God, you win. You win, Lord, you win. I will do it. And at the age of 18, I decided that I will enter ministry. I gave up my ambitions for university. I had ambitions. I wanted to become either a mechanical engineer or a physician. And, 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 and those were my aspirations. And I said, okay, I will follow your path. And I remember... When, when I was being placed in my first pastoral charge, now, the, the training that I had was not one where I was in a university all the way through my training. It was one where, as students, we were placed with congregations, just like I'm here right now. And one week out of each month, we would go to the university for lectures, and then we would go back to the congregation, or we call it the context, for ministry. And I remember when I was being taken to my first ministry outpost, so to speak, I said, oh no, God, this will not work. I was being taken to a deep rural area. Uh, and, and Jackie will be familiar with that, with that area. I, Jackie's from near that area. I was driving through Geisel and driving through, uh, through, through Port Marie and, and, and coming through Highgate and coming down because I was going to a place called Wood Park in, in St. Mary in Jamaica. Deep, deep rural Jamaica. And I've never seen houses like those. I've never seen landscape like those. I was tempted to jump out of the car and run. Literally, seriously, I'm telling you the truth. And I, I was terrified. I said, where am I going? What am I doing? God, what did I do? Anyways, I calmed myself down. I reached the place. And I realized, oh, but my dwelling is actually a really nice dwelling. So my spirit was lifted a bit. And then ministry started. And the work was... Not something I was anticipating. And then I came across this passage of scripture that says, Do not be hasty to teach, for do you know that those who teach will be judged more harshly? I said, God, if you had showed me this before, I would not be here today. But I'm getting it after the fact. I'm telling you this story because serving, listening to, hearing the voice of God calling us and listening to that voice, obeying that voice, doing what God calls us to do is not easy. And if we read the stories of the prophets in the Old Testament, particularly uh, the prophet Jeremiah, sorry, who was regarded as the weeping prophet, we would know that the service of God is not something to be taken lightly. For Jeremiah wept almost daily, asking God, why did you give me this task? Why do you give me these impossible people? And if you sit and listen to pastors sometimes in their own little settings speak about their work in their congregations, you will hear many of us mirroring the sentiments of Jeremiah. For Jesus says, if any would come after me, let him, let her deny himself, deny herself, take up the cross and follow me daily. That cross of Jesus symbolizes suffering. I'm just going to stop at that one word, suffering. Because this is what Eli was going through. And this is what Samuel was being called into. For the service of God is not easy. It is not impossible. But it is not easy. Jesus says it requires a denial of self. Everything that I've known, I have to throw out. I remember going to places sometimes and visiting with people. And the conditions in which I saw them live in broke my heart so much. But you know, they would offer you stuff. And you would think that the conditions in which they live were so unsanitary that... 
Normally, you would not want to share in a meal with them, but the scripture tells us that we should be sure to partake of what is presented before us. I remember many a times I had to deny myself because sometimes even though I was in some of those places and I could not even take my breath because the conditions were so unsanitary, it was difficult. But what those folks would offer you would have been their best. It was like the widow's might. That was, that was their blessing for you. And many a times I've found myself in those conditions and in those situations, but I had to identify with those who were suffering. I had to step inside their suffering. The calling of God on us is not easy. And that's why many of us, like I was doing at the beginning of my ministry, we, we, we stay away from wanting to hear that call and to follow that call because we know that we will have to give up some things. We know that we would have to relinquish some things with which we are comfortable and with which we are familiar. Many of us stay away from the service of the church. Stay away from service on this committee or that committee because it requires sacrifice. It requires giving up some things. It requires sometimes that maybe I can't have my dinner at 6 o'clock because I have to be doing the work of the ministry to which I'm called. Maybe I have to be giving up my time here or there because it requires of me to do so because of the ministry into which I have been called. But the calling of God, my friends, is upon all of us. It was not just for Samuel. It's not just for me as the one who stands here as minister, but it's for every one of us who hears the voice of Jesus saying, come and follow me. Following Jesus requires, as Paul puts it, if anyone be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. So it requires putting away the things that were yesterday. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. It requires me saying, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It is no longer I who direct my life, but Christ by his Holy Spirit who directs me. It is no longer about how I I feel or what I desire, but it is what God desires for me. It is no longer about how I think church should be or how I think service in the church should be, but what God directs me to do in the church. God is calling some of us today to serve. And even though some of us have been serving for many, 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 many years and we are tired. And some of us have been staying on the sidelines for many, many, many years and we do not want to come into the center. God is calling us to serve. What is it that God is calling you to do today? How is God asking you to help this community called Ebenezer United Church? To carry out its ministry responsibilities. Are you being called to be a worship leader? To ensure that on Sunday mornings we have somebody to moderate and not necessarily the same person doing it or just a single little group of persons doing it all the time. Are you being called to serve on a committee? Are you being called to serve in the community? in one way or the other. What is it that God might be calling you to do? What is it that has been in your heart for quite some time, you have wanted to do it, but for some reason you have just not stepped forward to do it? You have thought about it, you have said, you know, I would love to serve the church in this way. I would love to work at Ebenezer in this way. But there is just something preventing you from stepping forward. 
God has been saying to you, it's not you that has been desiring it. It's God who has been saying to you all this time, this is what I want you to do. It feels like you have been desiring it in your heart, but it's God who has been speaking to your heart and saying to you, this is what I want you to do. What might that be? Or you might have said to yourself, you know, I think I can do that for the church. But it's God who is saying to you, I think you can do that for the church. Is God calling you today? Is God calling you to go to the back at the end of service and sign up to do something in worship? Is God calling you to serve in a way that you have never served before? Well, may I be Eli for you today. You've perhaps thought that it was the minister calling you to serve or the board calling you to serve or Ebenezer community calling you to serve. May I be for you today, Eli, who stands in the place of the minister, who stands in the place of the board, who stands in the place of Ebenezer, and now that you might be sitting before me asking, did you call me? I will say to you, no, I did not call you, but the next time you hear that thing tugging on your heart, say, speak, Lord, your servant hears. In the name of God, who is Father, God, who is Son, and God, who is Spirit. Amen.